Brothels closed down, the police force was laid off because crime went so low, Bible sales skyrocketed throughout the nation. This is the story of the Welch Revival and its leader, Evan Roberts. I'm Roberts Laird, and this is God's Generals. The Evangelicals and the Pentecostal movements have all valued the great story of the Welch Revival. It is one of the most exciting revivals that I have read about and studied in all of my years of reading all the great leaders and the revival movements. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how God chose a young man named Evan Roberts. He was in his 20s when God chose him. So you don't have to be a doctor of theology or have all the experience or come from the right type of family. You have to just have the right heart and God will use you. And many of you have the right heart, but sometimes you've heard, well, you don't have this education, it didn't come from that church. That means nothing. God responds to the heart condition of a man or of a woman. Evan Roberts was born in Wales. His family worked in the coal mines like he did as a young man himself. He was known as he'd go into the coal mines. You know, back in those days, there was no child labor law. So children and teenagers worked like adult men worked in the mines. And so he would carry his Bible with him and go down into the mines. And during their breaks, they would, he would read the scriptures. And during the lunchtime, he'd read his scriptures. And he'd make a little place in the wall of the mine and left his Bible in there sometimes. Well, one time there was an explosion and the explosion burnt the pages of his Bible and became the famous scorch Bible that he would use throughout his life and throughout the revival that was to come. So Evan Roberts, to look at his life, is very interesting. His family was Christian, and so they grew up teaching the Bible stories and going to church, but Evan Roberts took it a step further. He seemed to have a personal relationship with God that he didn't have to come via the pastor or via his parents. He had it one for himself. And it was so intense at times, people would notice him walking down the roads to going to school or going home or going to the store. And he would just stop on the side of the road and he would just talk to himself. It was like he was talking to the air. And folks walking by or in horse and buggy or some of the early cars, but many horse and buggy, they would look at this young man, you know, talking to himself and they thought there was something wrong with him. So his parents had him taken to a special doctor to find out if there was. And the doctor came back and said that Evan Roberts had a religious fixation about him, that he would grow out of it in time. Well, I don't think his religious fixation ever stopped. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And I don't think they should have thought there was a problem because of the young man stopping and talking to God. If young men would talk to God more, they would not be talking to the wrong people. So Evan Roberts is also a young man that influenced his friends. Now, I think when you study the life of him, especially his early years, his friendships are important to consider. We're all influenced by who we hang around, who we talk with, who we are asking questions of, and their reactions to our conversations and our activities. And Evan Roberts was one of those. If you couldn't find him at school, you couldn't find him at home, you might find him playing sports with his friend, but most likely you would find him at church or doing something around his home church of Moriah Chapel. And so he was off at a revival meeting and uh, one of his friends had gone with him to attend this meeting and it was time for them to pray. And so they all got on their knees by the pew where they were at and some walked forward to the front of the church as the service was coming to an end. In those days, people were invited to come to the altar and pray and that's how they would end the service. In our days, we usually sing with a happy song and we leave with a shout and we leave the service. That we, In those days, they actually prayed the end of the service. And Evan Roberts knelt down And the Spirit of God came on him and spoke to him and showed him that there was coming a great revival to Wales and he was going to be a part of that great revival. And in this vision and this visitation, God said to him that over 100,000 souls would come to him in a short amount of time. So when this vision ended, he came out of it and he turned to his friend and said, do you believe that God can give us 100,000 souls in Wales? And his friend said, yes. Now to me, I'm so glad that he had a friend that went, yes. What would your friends say? Would your friends say, I don't think so, and give you all the reasons why this cannot happen? It reminds me in the scriptures about Daniel and his three friends. When the king was going to kill all the wise men because they couldn't interpret his dream, then Daniel said, give me some time. He leaves the king's throne room and goes to his friends and says, we've got to pray. And all of them get together and pray and get an answer. Thank God that we can have those kind of friends, and Evan Roberts did too. He goes back to his home church of Moriah Chapel, asked the pastor if he could have a youth meeting after the Sunday morning service. Well, mainly adults showed up and one or two youth showed up. 
And in this youth meeting of about 14 people, he expressed what God had said to him, and he prayed this famous prayer, O Lord, bend us, bend us, O Lord. And that was the prayer that began to ignite the Spirit of God in the heart of man in Wales. And from this little revival service or this little youth meeting sprung the revival meetings, and it began to grow, it began to increase, to where it affected the nations, and now a hundred and some years later, we still admire it, we still love it. When I come back, we're going to talk about the great happenings of the Welch Revival. What you've heard on today's show is only a small fraction of the incredible stories of another one of God's generals. For the complete story, pick up a copy of God's Generals, Volume 1, today. This historical classic contains the compelling spiritual biographies of 12 extraordinary heroes of faith, men and women who were dynamically empowered by the Holy Spirit to ignite the fires of revival worldwide. You will discover how they achieved their amazing successes and how you can become a victorious leader for God. In this volume, you will be captivated by the lives of John Alexander Dowie, Maria Woodworth Eder, Evan Roberts, Charles F. Parham, and William J. Seymour. John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, William Branham, Jack Coe, and A.A. A. Allen. Order a copy today or other life-changing books by visiting robertslearden.com. That's robertslearden.com. Or by calling 1-877-888-1500 for U.S. residents or 1-941-748-3883 for viewers outside the U.S. Roberts Learden accurately depicts without bias the good, bad, and the ugly so you can learn from the lives of God's generals. Order your copy today. I've always enjoyed reading about what happened in the Welch Revival, what went right, what went wrong. The Welch Revival began, as I said, in a youth meeting at Moriah Chapel. And thank God the pastor was not one of those that was scared to give one of his young men an opportunity to share his heart. And when he recognized that God was doing something, to support it. So many ministers today control so much that it would take an act of Congress, as my grandma used to say, for God to get through the door of the church. But at least in Moriah Chapel, on this time period in the early 1900s, the pastor said yes to Evan Roberts and the revival began to start. When the testimonies begin to roll, the crowds begin to come and fill up because they heard about a promise that God was going to visit the little nation of Wales. And as it began to spark and begin to happen, all groups, young and old, came and they would come into a service. And here's how the revival meetings were like. They were conducted this way. Evan Roberts was not really wanting to be the star. He said to him about himself, I want to be the window that you look through to see God. Don't look at me, look through me, or look at who I'm pointing at. So one of his great characteristics that helped the beginning of the revival, which also became a weakness of a revival, is he didn't want to be the great star of it, but yet you need to be a leader of it. And so there's a great walk you have to have between not wanting to be the star, but yet still taking the position that God gave you. And Evan Roberts found that in the beginning and began to be used to become a catalyst of the great uh, flow of the Spirit. When he would come to the service, he may preach, he may not preach. He'd normally sit on the side of the platform or he'd be off in the pastor's office, off the side of the, of the auditorium space, and the crowd would fill up, sometimes outside the, uh, the doors onto the sidewalks. They'd open the windows of the chapels and so the folks outside could hear. And they would come and they would sit quietly and then there would be little weepings or cryings or a little rumble of people praying. And uh, they were not always waiting for Evan to show up, even though that was in the room, but the people came already prepared to talk to God for themselves. And at times there would become loud weepings and cryings. And then there would come people who would just stand up and start singing songs that they knew or songs out of their spirit. Other times they would stand up two or three and sing songs together. And so there was a lot of freedom in the Welch Revival to allow the people to respond to the unction and the spontaneity of the Spirit as it came on them and moved through them. If Evan Roberts would come into the room, like I said, he would sit here. He may grace the pulpit and stand up there and talk for five minutes or 10 minutes. He was not a very long-winded preacher. He may not preach at all. He may get up and stand behind the pulpit and start to pray and then disappear behind it. And all you would think, well, he was there and now he's behind the pulpit praying. You could hear his voice. He may be behind the pulpit praying for the next hour and get up and walk off and walk out and leave the crowd. And so it was not your normal American or British style of doing church. It was a flow of the Spirit and that Evan Roberts was being led by the Spirit the best that he knew. Now, some of the great happenings in the revival, besides the great salvations, is that when you read and research the move of God in Wales, here are some statistics. 
during the time of the Welch Revival, which was beginning in 1902, three and four, in that time period, and then begin to kind of uh, slide down or begin to decline, during the time of, the, of its height, there was policemen were laid off of the police force because crime went so low. Drunkenness statistically went down because people quit drinking. They went to church and drank the new wine, not the old wine. Also, the Bible Society recorded that they had a record number of orders for Bibles, and to several years after the revival ended, they were still filling the orders to print Bibles that were, that were ordered during the revival. And so those are a few things. Now, here are some things that I enjoy when I read about the Welch Revival. I love the story about the, the pit ponies in the coal mines. When the revival hit, so strong in Wales, and, and Wales is mainly a coal mining type of uh, a country, that the coal miners quit cussing. And you know, when you're not born again, you'd say all what you want to say, you use profanity. And the ponies, they don't know bad words from good words. All they know was that sound meant go and the other sound meant stop. And so when the coal miners got saved, or as a newspaper said, when the coal miners got religion, they quit cussing. And the little ponies got confused because the coal miner wouldn't say damn to go or say something else for it to stop. And so the little ponies got all confused and the coal mine companies had to go out and buy a whole new herd of horses and train them on how to carry the coal out and bring the cart back down. And so to me, that was so exciting to know that the revival had affected the ponies and they didn't know what to do because the coal miners quit cussing. The other thing that I find very intriguing about the Welch Revival was during the time uh, every year, like every nation does, is that we have uh, sports events. In America, we have the World Series, we have the Super Bowl, and in America, we call it soccer. In Europe, we call it uh, football. And so in Wales, during the time of the revival, uh, they didn't have a Super Bowl or a World Cup for their nation. When you read in 1901, who won the uh, football game, who won the, the big tournament, and then you get down to the year of the revival, and then it's written in the name where you should put the name of the team that won, and it just says revival. There was no tournament because everybody was going to church and having a religious experience. Now that's like saying in America that we didn't have a Super Bowl because everybody was going to church and more concerned about God and the condition of their soul than they were about the Super Bowl. That would be a big event. The other great thing about the Welch Revival was that the business hours in the nation changed. When no one's shopping, why keep the store open? When no one is going to the restaurants, why keep it open? The business hours of Wales during the time of the revival changed because business concluded early because no one was buying or selling or doing business. They were going home, getting dressed, going to church, and maybe be there to midnight to two or three o'clock and then start again. Can you imagine in America or in London or in Berlin that all of a sudden a move of God comes and the business hours of the whole nation changes to accommodate the people wanting to go to church and wanting to be around God and wanting to be moved by the moving of the Spirit in their own soul. That's what happened in Wales. These are just a few stories that shows you the impact. The young people were involved, the children were involved, the elderly were involved. There was over a hundred preachers that we know of that was being used by God all over Wales at one time. So it was not just around Evan Roberts' personality, even though he was the leader. He's the one that God chose to be the catalyst. But there was at least a hundred people, hundred ministers that were being used all over Wales. In a couple of minutes, we're going to be letting you hear the only voice recording of Evan Roberts. It is a rare piece of church history. I'm so glad I found it. It was almost lost to the decay of time, but it was reconstructed and put together. In a few moments, you're going to get to hear the Welch revivalist himself speak as he did during the time of the revival. And also when we come back, we're going to talk about the tragedy of this great revival. This revival only lasted a few years and declined. What happened to the revivalists? Why did it decline? What can we learn from it? That's when we come back. What you've heard on today's show is only a small fraction of the incredible stories of another one of God's generals. For the complete story, pick up a copy of God's Generals, Volume 1 today. This historical classic contains the compelling spiritual biographies of 12 extraordinary heroes of faith, men and women who were dynamically empowered by the Holy Spirit to ignite the fires of revival worldwide. You will discover how they achieved their amazing successes and how you can become a victorious leader for God. In this volume, you will be captivated by the lives of John Alexander Dowie, Maria Woodworth Eder, Evan Roberts, Charles F. Parham, and William J. Seymour. John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, William Branham, Jack Coe, and A. A. Allen. Order a copy today or other life-changing books by visiting robertslearden.com. That's robertslearden.com. 
or by calling 1-877-888-1500 for U.S. residents or 1-941-748-3883 for viewers outside the U.S. Roberts Learden accurately depicts without bias the good, bad, and the ugly so you can learn from the lives of God's generals. Order your copy today. Hope you'll take time to call the number on your screen or visit my website and order the book, God's Generals. We talk a lot more about Evan Roberts and the great revival and the great uh, harvest that happened and all the other stories that I don't have time to tell because I want to focus here for the next few minutes on the tragedy of the Welch revival. A lot of times when people talk about Evan Roberts and the Welch revival, they always talk about the good part, the great part, which I would love to focus on. But to give you the complete story, you've got to tell the rest of the story. That's why sometimes people don't understand why revivals kind of end strange or weird. We don't investigate that part. When I first read about Evan Roberts, I thought, wow, a man in his mid-20s shook a nation, had crowds that were huge, people were getting saved, the business hours changed, Bible sales are up, policemen were fired or let go because crime was so low, and there wasn't a, a football term because revival had taken over the hearts and the focus of the nation. That's phenomenal. Even the day when you go to Wales, people still have memories and talk about that time. But then when you ask, what happened to Evan Roberts? Why did the revival end? That's what I want to talk about now, because most of us don't realize that a move of God has a beginning, a middle, and they all end. How they end is important to understand. They're supposed to be handed off to go to someplace greater or to a new generation. But most revivals end tragic and then sad. Evan Roberts had eight nervous breakdowns in his life. The fourth was the most tragic and the deepest one of his life in the midst of the revival. Number one, Evan Roberts kept going and going and going every night, every night, and did not know how to rest, did not know how to take care of himself during a move of God. Now that's why a lot of preachers, a lot of great evangelists, they die before their time, they die tragically ill, they die in these ways where they think if you're that close to God and God used you to save the people or heal the sick, why'd you die sick? Or why did these bad happenings happen to you? Evan Roberts was preaching one night and after the end of the meeting, he collapsed. And there was a woman in the crowd that was a noted minister in England named Jesse Pin Lewis. Jesse Pin Lewis has written some good books, but I have to say at this time in her life, she had been under certain types of questioned by the brothers because she began to preach certain things in an extreme state. Any truth taught to an extreme is an error. So you can take any biblical truth and go too far with it and it becomes an error. Hers and Evan Roberts at that time had kind of pulled them together because he was preaching about suffering and she was gone into extreme suffering and she came to hear Evan Roberts preach, happened to be in the meeting where he collapsed. Well, she kind of took charge of the situation and put him on a stretcher and took, put him out on a train with her and took him out of Wales into England and put, her in a, put him in her guest house in the back of her big property. Her husband is what we would call the mayor of the town here in America's political structure. And so she called the doctors and they began to examine him and they said that he was exhausted and that he should never preach again or he might die because of how his body was taking the strain of the heavy pressures of preaching and going and this move of God. And so she began to say, well, just stay here in this house and rest and, 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 and relax. And while he was in a state of exhaustion, nervous breakdown, she began to tell him things in the Bible that were wrong. Everything that God was doing, she was mad at. People were getting healed. The gifts of the Spirit were flowing. For example, the newspapers recorded that Evan Roberts was telepathic, which means in our vocabulary that he knew things about people and would point people out in the crowd and say something to them and encourage them to get right or to come to God. And the newspaper said he was telepathic. Well, that's the gifts of the Spirit. You can't get mad at the newspapers. They don't know what it is. And they didn't use the vocabulary that we use today back then, but that's what it was. So the gifts of the Spirit flowing, speaking in tongues, deliverance, healings, were all taking place. And of course, in every revival, there are things that happen that are fleshly and demonic. You can't stop that. You correct it and you kick it out and you keep on going. She began to tell him that it was his fault for permitting it and began to convince him that many of these things were of the devil. Evan Roberts never went back to Wales and after Jesse Penn Lewis died, she took him out of where God had placed him. His seat of authority was in Wales. It was not in England or in Scotland or in Ireland. It was in Wales, the Welsh country. And when she removed him from where God placed him, number one, 
and it might have seemed right at the moment, but there was a motive that was wrong in her. She wanted to ride his popularity to gain back and prove that she was right. And plus in her, I believe a Jezebelic spirit was operating to some degree and begin to tell him, it's of the devil. You can't do this. Stop. When his family came to see him, she did not permit the family to see Evan Roberts. When Evan Roberts, his spiritual pastor and brothers come to visit him, they weren't allowed to see him either. So the first thing that I saw happen here was why in the world didn't someone get a little more irate and take the young man back to his family, back to his home church? She wouldn't permit it. She had closed him in, cut him off, isolated him, and kept feeding him all the wrong things. I've learned this by reading and, and studying these preachers. If you're in trouble, you need to go home. Go back to your family. Go back to your home church. I don't care if it's in the woods. I don't care if it's far away from where you are. When you are hurt, when you are broken, when you are tired, when you are sick, you need people that understand you spiritually, emotionally, physically, socially, to help put you back together. Many a preacher could have survived their tragedy if they'd have went home to their family and home to their church family. These people is a part of God's protection, part of God's covering, and part of God's blessing in your life. Put a value on it. If you're in trouble today, go home. Go back to your family. Go back to your spiritual family. Let their love, their counsel, their encouragement, their admonishments be a part of what puts you back together and heals your soul and strengthens your spirit and puts the zeal back into your life. If people like Jim and Tammy Baker of the PTO world would have gone home during their crisis instead of going to someone else outside of their like precious faith, the PTO crisis would not have happened. So please learn from Evan Roberts and the PTL scandal. When you're in trouble, when you're exhausted, when there's a problem, go home to your biological family and your spiritual family. He did not return to Wales after Jesse Penn Lewis died. He goes back never to preach again. The Welsh revival only lasted about three years maximum, give or take a few months. He dies in 1951. His last journal, entry in his journal, was that he didn't know why he was born. Evan Roberts died and was buried in 1951. And his last thoughts was, why was I here? Why was I born? What was my purpose? That Jezebelic spirit had removed him from his place of authority, his place of anointing, and convinced him that he would lose his whole life. When he didn't lose his life, he lost his calling, and he died not knowing why he was born. I don't want that to happen to you or to anybody that you know. Learn from the mistakes of the Welch Revival and make it right. I want you to get my book. I want you to read what happened in more detail than what I can do on this TV show. But there are many of you that God has called and you're listening to a lie. It's time to come back to where you want to be. I want to pray for you right now. I want to ask God to visit you right where you are and to deliver you from the chains of false words and false prophecies and the wrong control over your life. And may you have enough strength to return to the place where you first got your call, the people that love you, that pray for you, and speak the right words to your heart and mind. I pray that you have strength to do that and to return to your post. I pray for you in the name of Jesus. So we go off this air today. I want you to listen to the voice of the Welsh Revival. And remember, no matter how bad it is, God can turn around for you if you'll just ask him and do what is right.
What you've heard on today's show is only a small fraction of the incredible stories of another one of God's generals. For the complete story, pick up a copy of God's Generals, Volume 1, today. This historical classic contains the compelling spiritual biographies of 12 extraordinary heroes of faith, men and women who were dynamically empowered by the Holy Spirit to ignite the fires of revival worldwide. You will discover how they achieved their amazing successes and how you can become a victorious leader for God. In this volume, you will be captivated by the lives of John Alexander Dowie, Maria Woodworth Eder, Evan Roberts, Charles F. Parham, and William J. Seymour. John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Amy Semple McPherson, Catherine Coleman, William Branham, Jack Coe, and A.A. A. Allen. Order a copy today or other life-changing books by visiting robertslearden.com. That's robertslearden.com. Or by calling 1-877-888-1500 for U.S. residents or 1-941-748-3883 for viewers outside the U.S. Roberts Learden accurately depicts without bias the good, bad, and the ugly so you can learn from the lives of God's generals. Order your copy today. The legendary A. A. Allen called The Miracle Man a dramatic ministry of signs and wonders. Catherine Kuhlman, whose miracle-filled meetings drew millions of skeptics to faith. Smith Wigglesworth, the plumber who read no book but the Bible, known as the Apostle of Faith. Amy Semple McPherson, the glamorous and flamboyant founder of the Foursquare Gospel Church and the nation's first Christian radio station. God's Generals, 12 compelling biographies in one 12-volume DVD set. Hosted by historian author Robert Slairdon. Just $129. Available at your local bookstore, God's Generals, by historian author Robert Slairdon.